we're going to talk about Betula papyrifera and Betula alleghaniensis. And Betula alleghaniensis is um, geographically isolated to Appalachia. So you don't have yellow birch trees in Russia. Um, you don't have them in, in you know, Asia. You don't have them in Alaska. You would have them in Maine, Vermont, you know, New Hampshire. The yellow birch trees are, are pretty different than white birch trees. And I just started to notice this recently. White birch trees are a softwood. They often fall down and bend, and they're the first to die in like an ice storm. Uh, yellow birch trees are like one of the strongest hardwoods. They don't fall, they're very sturdy. They actually have a lot of commercial value. So like veneer, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with veneer, but veneer is like when they take a big section of a hardwood trunk and they put it on a lathe essentially, and they get a spool of a thin layer of, of a product that they can layer over furniture. They make wooden doors and things like that. And so you need a hardwood tree to do that. And yellow birch is really prized for that. It's one of the best uh, trees to use for that, if not affected by chaga or some sort of tree, tree uh, destroying mushroom. So um, loggers are very interested in yellow birch trees. Yellow birch trees also take an outrageous amount of time to grow. Uh, they're an old growth species. So like they're an indicator of a mature forest, but they take like seriously nine years to grow one inch in horizontal trunk expansion. So if you see a tree, a yellow birch tree, that is a foot in diameter, just recognize that tree is over 100 years old. I learned about this because I had a well drilled at my property where I'm building my house, and the well driller showed up like 10 minutes early, and the guy cut down the one like decent sized yellow birch tree that I had native to my property, and I was like, what the hell? Because I had literally transplanted five yellow birch saplings, and I, and I was so upset but I bit my tongue because like I was being charged by the foot. <laughs> and so, but I counted the rings on that thing and it was like four inches in diameter and this tree was 35 years old. I was like, there's no way that's right. And then I did reading and I was like, no, that's definitely right. And so um, that was an eye opener because I thought it was like 10 years old maybe. And that would be the case for a white birch tree. White birch trees only take like four years to grow one inch. So this is a really big white birch tree. This is probably like 18 inches to 24 inches in diameter, the trunk. So um, this is about an 88, 90 year old, maybe even a hundred year old white birch tree. It's about as big as you're gonna get for a white birch tree. These are some massive yellow birch trees. And we wanted to show this because a few things like the bark on these big yellow birch trees becomes so obscured. It's hard to even tell it's a birch tree. So a lot of people wouldn't recognize this as a birch. But yes, it is. It's Betula alleghaniensis. And so you see there's a lot of symbiotic relationships going on. You have lichen, you have moss, you have various fungi right there. But there's a polypore, then there's like an oyster mushroom that had just died. And I don't know, this is, I can't even come close to wrapping my arms around it. This has got to be a 36 inch diameter tree. And so like literally, I kid you not, this is over 300 years old. Like, and it's hard because when you, if you were to cut this down and try and count the rings, you'd get to like, I don't know, maybe 150 and then you'd reach a big section of tree rot in the middle that a fungus has caused and you can't really age these trees, but that tree rot actually hollows them out from the inside and these trees become like extremely important vessels of refuge in the forest. Um, Martin and Fisher love yellow birch trees, uh, mainly because yellow birch trees are the har are hardwood tree. So it will like, it has a hollow because it's affected by fungi and the females can den in it, but it's also hard enough to protect them from predators that are larger than them trying to get in because they can't excavate it, you know? So they find these trees, birds and woodpeckers that can see UV light that are produced by fungi will preferentially come to these trees to look for insects and to form densites because they'll be softened by the fungi and they, they come to understand this. They may not even know why, but there's studies that show that woodpeckers literally choose the trees based on the fungi, the light produced by these fungi. I mean, you'll see sap sucker holes and all these different things. And, and also I just learned that 400 species of moths and butterflies depend on yellow birch trees. That's why we have the Luna moth and all these other cool things in the Adirondacks. And so yellow birch trees, which is where the majority of the chaga comes from that we harvest. And I, you know, I know like 75% at least of chaga in the Adirondacks probably is lurking on yellow birch trees. And to consider that these trees are literally like upwards of 200 years old, you know, the, the ones that we harvest significant pieces of chaga from, that was kind of breathtaking and also scary to learn that because 
like right now yellow birch trees are the premier crop um, and the reason for that is just because for a long time ever since 1965 once the feller bruncher was invented and mechanized logging took over and made chainsaws redundant the efficiency at which uh, logging can harvest a select species was just improved dramatically so like all of the top quality species which were the black cherry the ash the maples all of your hardwood trees they were taken and like there's a literal joke right now in tupper lake about tupper lake hardwoods because now they only sell softwoods because they're out of these trees and like um, i'm starting to learn that there's going to be longer holds or so the foresters will say uh, about the the holdings in the industry on the land and and that's because there's no more trees left besides yellow birch trees so all these trees that were selectively left behind for years have grown to be so many hundred years old that's the reason there's so much chaga in the adirondacks when we've come into a chaga grove it's because they selectively left those trees behind and so um right now i'm seeing a lot of these land parcels being cut harder than they've ever been cut before the landowners are then selling them to the state of new york which is tying up the asset because you can't harvest chaga on state land not commercially um and so it's like wow the time is right now to figure out like a long-term regenerative model for my business because like when the loggers stop cutting then the chaga that's coming to us is going to dry out like we we don't really have to work that hard to get chaga because there's a whole industry right now fronting the cost of that paying the liability insurance fronting the bill of these boots on the ground getting the chaga on the trees and it's the most efficient way to to do it if you're cutting down a tree you can get the chaga on it that you and i can't get you know because it's 30 feet up and so um i know that that's a temporary thing that we're experiencing it's a moment in time and um we need to we need to have a solution before that time ends and that can and that it you know is in the face of that would be you know a large piece of property that's yeah. strictly there for fungus I think so. I think that honestly, between 50 acres and 100 acres of land, if it's the right type of forest, which means you're going to need a lot of water, whether that's a stream or a river or a swamp, whatever, I know you need moisture. There needs to be mature yellow birch trees existing on the property. Um, and then we can transplant white birch trees, right? So as many birch trees as possible, but like really you need some yellow birch trees. You need a healthy population of yellow birch trees that are going to be old enough already that they will come to be eight inches in diameter before we die. You know, like they, there's not enough time in a lifetime to accomplish rebuilding these trees in the forest, the old growth forest that it takes to make chaga. And so I don't believe that the lab grown chaga is anything, anything noteworthy or anything similar to wild chaga. And uh, I think honestly, it's just like, for whatever reason, I'm starting to feel like that's why I'm here. Like. This is gonna be the work of my career. It's pretty specific. I see it now. That's the plan. And I'm, I'm gonna do it. I have to, you know, cause it would be a total betrayal to everything I've ever believed in to just build this business until we run out of Chaga and try and sell it off to somebody who's gonna make it cheap, you know, just reduce the value of what we do and the quality of the product. So when it comes to the logging and the, the Chaga, like there's so much Chaga right now that goes to waste. And that, that to me is a big, obvious potential like opportunity to start capturing that chaga that goes to waste but also like it's a problem because right now there's all of this concern and, and really genuine passion for making chaga sustainable everybody wants to be sustainable if you post a video harvesting chaga you're bound to get hate from somebody that has no idea what they're talking about you know thinking that you're some sort of evil colonizers <laughs> taking from the forest and it's like wait wait listen though like like, have you ever been to the Adirondacks? Like, have you ever seen what like they're doing in these logging industries? Like, have you ever bought wood products? Like, are you using yellow birch flooring or veneer? Like, and just, you know, if you have, if you've never even thought of those things, then I just want to say like, you're blind. You're blind to an industry that has been doing this for years that have strategic plans, sustainable management plans that are embraced by the state of New York and other governments and regulators to strategically eradicate the forest of tree diseases and tree rot fungal organisms like chaga. Like if you look at the US Forest Service, if you look at the USDA, like, and you really dig deeper, like the clinker polypore, so they call it, chaga, is like literally an invasive tree disease. But then you have the United Plant Savers saying it's like, you know, uh, an endangered medicinal plant. And then you have like all these different points that are not talking to each other. But what I see is the reality. I see what I see and I know that logging and land management, right? Whoever owns the land, they're gonna have the largest control and impact on Chaga's sustainability for the long term. And so 
we're not trying to change, you know, logging. Right? I'm not trying to change what they do, but, but I think a more broad and well-rounded approach to modern land management is important. And how do you do that? You have to buy land. So you have to set a new standard. And just because you're harvesting chaga and you're, you know, doing that and people are, you know, saying whatever, but these companies that are, they're clear cutting the land. So the harvesting, there isn't going to be a tree to leave any chaga on too. If there isn't a forest there anymore. The clear cutting thing, I think is it's, they've kind of rebranded clear cutting, right? Cause a logger would say, we don't clear cut. That's been illegal since, since 1965, probably. I don't know when, but it's illegal, right? The, we have the APA. So just technicality there, but what they do is they have selective timber harvesting protocols and they can, those, those protocols change, right? It could be anything. Right? Like currently the selective harvesting protocols for yellow birch trees are any over eight inches in diameter. So like, okay, I, I would say that's worse than clear cutting, you know, because you're, that's like literally like- A hundred years. Genocidal, like there's grave implications of that for the long-term ecology. Cause like, if you do that, you and I know well that like, okay, so that's all of the trees that are gonna bear chaga. Like, so that you're gonna just then create a forest in a vast area of land where chaga is not able to grow at all. Or if, even if it does, put it this way, even if it does, chaga will actually kill small yellow birch trees and sporulate before it even produces a sclerotia. So like you'll find chagas in chaga forests if you really know what you're looking for. And if you know how to find chaga fruiting bodies and poroids, but you won't see the big chaga horn. This is exactly what I'm talking about, about the chaga that doesn't even produce chaga. Like, so if the, if the tree is young and not very big, like Inonotus obliquus, the fungus, will infiltrate it, form mycelium, kill it, and, and sporulate before it even needs to produce a sclerotia, which is like the harvestable part we call chaga, because like it just won, it beat the tree, because the, the chaga forms as a defensive organ for the fungus to beat the tree. So this literally, this, this, this right here, these are gonna be filled with chaga spores. Most of them have been eaten and taken by insects, uh, but like this is, oh, look right here. Come here, there is a sclerotia. That's chaga. It was probably harvested and still the chaga sporulated. So like when you have trees this big, you don't get very much chaga. Chaga will grow, chaga will survive, but it won't be helpful for people that are looking to harvest sclerotia because that forms from a fight between a really old growth, powerful tree and a, a virulent fungus.